Hello, everybody. Nice to be here. I'm four nights in on Vegas, so I'm a little gravelly. Uh, but hello. So if you follow Cinema 40 at all, there's a decent chance that you've seen some of my tutorials in the past. You've seen some of the tools that I've worked on. But now uh, I am over, uh, and I'm Chris Schmidt, so hi, everybody. So uh, I am now at Rocket Lasso, my own company that I just started. And we are going to be doing a whole bunch of fun stuff over there, doubling down on all the things that I love, especially in the world of Cinema 4D. And we are going to be doubling down on the live streams, which I've already begun. We are going to be doing tutorials. And eventually, we are going to be having a bunch of new tools, which is going to be really exciting. One of the big focuses early on is going to be the live streams. So I've already got those up and set up. And the live streams are kind of phase one of community. Uh, the new website that's getting built, we're going to be doubling down group projects, lots of fun stuff, community, just people coming together, asking questions, helping. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. And then on top of that, we are doing the live stream. So we've got Rocket Lasso Live now. So we're going to be live streaming every Wednesday, which at 2 p.m. Central Time. And we just take, I just take questions from people in the audience, and we try and make it up on the spot and and answer questions. I'm going to be having a bunch of really fun guests on the show. I've already been lining up a, a bunch of really great people. I think you're going to like it. And it's just really fun. So it's a two-hour show. And last week on Wednesday, we got to make this completely from scratch in two hours. So it's just an example of the kind of thing that we might be able to achieve in that amount of time. It's really fun to see the process from the beginning to the end and then uh, put it out into the world for everybody to, to, uh, to learn from. But let's get to the good stuff today, the presentation. So if you've ever seen any of my NAB or SIGGRAPH presentations, I often do tips, tricks, and techniques. And I kind of thought I would do that again, except I'm going to be doing that while focusing exclusively on dynamics in Cinema 4D. So hopefully there's a little something for everybody in this one. In addition to that, this is kind of a little primer on an entire, tut on an entire tutorial series that I'm working for on Rocket Lasso. It's going to be a bunch of in-depth tutorials on controlling your dynamics. So there's just a, a little taste of what is to come. So let's get right into it. We have a lot to cover. We'll probably end up skipping some because we will not have enough time. So the very first one is just kind of a learning methodology, which is so much more important when you're dealing with simulations, too. So we're, let's talk about iteration and iterative learning. So I've got this nice, simple, clean scene file here. I've just got a bunch of cylinders all lined up, put a coin texture on there, and they're in a cloner. Super straightforward setup. And uh, let's say that we want to have these coins spin around. But you want to you have control over what they're doing. You want to know exactly when they're going to fall down. You have to hit a certain, a certain mark. You want to know what you're doing. Now, you can go and grab one coin and run the simulation. And so right now, let's even do that. I'm going to turn off my cloner. We got one coin. Hit play. It's actually going to flop over because the orientation changes. Actually, it looks like I have to turn on my uh, dynamics. Do, 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 do. OK, we'll just leave the cloner on here. Actually, let's set the cloner to one. So you could have a single coin here, which is going to spin over there. And we could go and try and tweak the settings. Let's say it's not spinning long enough, so we're like, OK, we've already got some initial angular velocity, so let's go ahead and crank that up further. So let's try and do that. And it's like, well, it's spinning better, but now it's too long. A better way to approach this is let's make a whole bunch of them. Let's make 10 clones here. And now we've got 10 clones, so we're getting 10 different iterations. Now, all of these have identical settings, but you know Cinema 4D's dynamics have some built-in noise. So if I hit play, we're not going to get completely identical. You see, they're incredibly similar, but they're not identical. Now, we could make them more identical by jumping into our dynamics tag and going to our collision, getting rid of some collision noise. There's different things you can do there. But right now, we actually do want the variation. And actually, we want to see a bunch of variations. What I'm going to do, so let's go ahead and pause this, rewind. An important thing in dynamics is make your changes at the time of zero because the dynamics they're not calculating it. If you make changes later, especially if you're playing with soft bodies, it might lock that shape in and you lose it and you have to reload your file. So what we're going to do here is actually make a duplicate of our cylinder and then we're going to change our cloner from iterate mode to blend mode. And you probably know this, but that is going to take all of your clones and transition from one shape into the next one as long as it's all the same hierarchy. But that's not limited to just the object. It also applies to the tags. So what this means is we can jump into one of these tags and change one of the settings and then see the transition from one to the other. So let's go ahead and crank this one up like crazy far. So let's go like 4,000. Let's grab the other one, and we're going to go really light on it. So let's just do 40. 
So let's go ahead and hit play here. And what we're going to see is a blending of that setting all the way across. So instead of doing a test and tweaking it up and then tweaking it down, we can now spin this and be like, which one of these is looking best? Which one has the timing that we want? And this one right there, that one's looking really good. So that's the third coin over on that side. I'm just going to go ahead and really quickly make my cloner editable. Select that coin. Take a look at what setting that ends up being. So that ends up being about 1,000. So there, that's my magic number. I'm going to hit undo. And now we can grab both of these, and I'm going to set them both to 1,000. So now we can get some different iterations of that 1,000, which is a good speed. But now we can play with some additional variables. You'll see, you'll see here that I've actually got a little bit of spin on here, kind of if I were to turn off my initial angular, which is set to 1,000. Let's hit play. You'll actually see they're rolling slightly in that direction. And actually, the, the dynamics are so accurate. They're, they'll just roll, and they won't tip over. And uh, I found out that if I didn't add in that little bit of rotation, that they wouldn't, the twist wouldn't look as nice. Let's go ahead and put that to zero and give this a spin. And you'll see without that little bit of rotation, they're going to twirl so perfectly that they don't want to fall over for a long time. And I wanted to get that kind of rolling around effect. But we don't know exactly what the best number of that would be. So let's go ahead, pause that, rewind it. And let's go ahead and leave one at zero. And we'll put one of them up to some crazy big number. Probably too high, but we'll do about 2,000. I type in 2 instead of 2,000 because it's quicker to type 2s. And then move your hand halfway across the keyboard. Let's go ahead and do that iteration and see a spin. OK, a bunch of those going way off. So we know 2,000 is too high. So let's go ahead and drop that down to something more reasonable. We'll go back to about 400. Hit play, and now we've got a little more variation. You can see that these are a little bit more of a shake. These spin a little bit more straightforward. So the point here is we are able to rapidly iterate. We're able to see a whole bunch of different changes in a very short time and choose the effect that we want. So which one of these is just kind of stylistically looking best to me? I kind of like the way that was moving there, but it kind of moved away a little quickly, so I couldn't tell. Once again, we can just rewind. I can see that's the one I like. Go ahead and make it editable real quick. Grab that one. Click on the dynamics. That one's about 200. I could copy that exact number if I wanted to. Hit undo, get these back again. And that quickly, we now have dialed that particular number in. And I can pick exactly the effects that I'm looking for. And this goes for every single setting. And I do this very often to dial in my dynamics. If I don't know what a setting does, it's like, OK, does friction in this scenario mean anything? So let's go ahead and do zero friction on one. Let's go ahead and do. Uh, 999 on the other. Let's see if friction has any sort of a variable here. It might, it might not. And OK, apparently it does. We did such a big range here that it forced it to show us if there was having an effect. If we did a tiny little tweak, it's like 99, eh, 200, eh, 300. There's such a small range that you're not gaining information. But now we learned the range here that this was being affected. So this one probably has a really, it's got a lot of friction, so it killed it really quick. After that, it kind of slowed it. You can see that they slow down a little bit, but not too different from each other. So friction isn't having a, that much of an effect in this scene. But the whole point here is doing these kind of iterations, making multiple copies. If I'm doing a soft body simulation, maybe I don't want to have 10 copies, but I can have three of them and be like, which, variable, which of these two is closer to what I wanted, and then dial it in that direction. So let's jump on into the next one, which I believe is forces. So forces are, it's so cool. We had these forces in this menu over here. These forces under the simulate menu, particle forces, we've had those forever on the old school emitter that we had forever and since like version six. And then, of course, there's new life breathed into those with a whole bunch of the new systems inside of Cinema 4D. But somehow, when Dynamics came out, there was one force that I never played with. And that's because that lived in this menu here in the simulate menu in the dynamic tab. And this force is just called force. So it's a force force. And it's just another effect. But what this one does, and I've just never played with it, by creating it, well, let's see what our scene is doing right here. I've just got a cloner, and we got a cube. Let's go ahead and add on a dynamic tag directly onto the cube, just a straightforward, rigid body. Zoom out a bunch. I've just got a cloner making this set of stairs. We can hit play, and boom, they all just kind of fall and collapse, doing their own thing. Now, uh, actually, before we talk about the forces, I want to talk a little bit, another little tip here of something I've been doing recently. Uh, you can see the cubes are falling, and they're dynamic cubes, and they're behaving like dynamic cubes. But what I want to be doing here is maybe doing a little bit of maybe a, a really low-resolution liquid simulation. So cubes are going to run really quick in the viewport. They're really simple. There's not that many polygons. The volume, the new uh, volumes in Cinema 4D can handle a cube really well. But they're rolling and behaving like cubes, and that's not what I want. But something that's really straightforward and I've been finding myself doing more and more often is forcing my dynamics to behave in different ways by changing in the collision tab the shape from automatic and it 
pretty often you've probably been changing it from automatic to something like moving mesh where you want it to calculate every single polygon. But what I've been doing a little bit more often is telling something like a cube to behave like a sphere, an ellipsoid. So we do that and it's going to kind of wrap a circle around it, averaging out the distance. And now when I hit play, changing nothing else, you're going to see that these are rolling around as if they're spheres, but we're still getting that nice super low poly um, running of a, a bunch of clones of a simple cube. So I've been doing that more and more. So now we've got these rolling cubes. So that's a, a really fun start right there. Now let's go ahead and talk about those new forces, the new force here. So if we jump to the simulate menu, go to dynamics and create a force from scratch here, then uh, we've got a whole bunch of different settings. And once again, iteration, play around, figure out what the different numbers are doing. So an example here is jumping kind of orders of magnitude. Right now, uh, if we're going to hit play on force, it feels a little bit different, but I can't tell why. So what I want to do is keep on cranking the number like further and further and further. And I think the clearest way to do that is going to be, let's rewind and set this to negative one. And let's go ahead and, in fact, and then, and then the, we've got an inner and outer distance, and that's a really important number. It's, what's happening here is that every individual clone, every dynamic object is attracting all of the other ones around it. Uh, and by setting a negative, every single one of them is forcing them away from each other. So it's kind of like a, a, an attract force, uh, particle force, except per object. And I used to manually put a different attractor in every single clone. But just by making the single force object, it can apply to all of them. So uh, the radius is very important. Our cubes are exactly 10. So we can go ahead and make our radius uh, about double that because we want the axis of one cube to go the circle from there to reach the axis of the next one. So let's go ahead and jump that up, and I'm going to put 27 here. I know those numbers from tinkering around earlier. That's not the interesting part. So now each cube is only kind of affecting its neighbor a little bit. And if I play, you see our force of neg negative 1 not doing much. Let's go ahead and try negative 11. Hit play. Still nothing visually happening. Let's try 1, 1, 1. 100. A little, oh, little something's happening. You see they're spreading out a little bit there. Let's go ahead and put another one on there. And, okay, a nice little pop. Let's put another one on there. So now we're getting so many. And now, boom, we suddenly get the explosion. Now there's suddenly enough force for them to force each other away and get that cool explosion. And if we were going, if we're going easy on this number, we're like, let's try one. Let's try two. Let's try three. Let's try all these tiny little iterations you'd never learn. So now I probably learned that uh, 11,000 is probably a little too much for what I was going for here. But I now know the range. I could say, okay, that's powerful. Let's go ahead and cut that in half. And I was really quickly, easily, easy. It was really easy to get to that range really quickly. So we can see this behaving in a negative force. So let's go ahead and, and swap it to be positive. This might be an insanely high number here. Uh, but these should all get attracted to each other. And now you see we instantly get this dynamic blob rolling down our stairs here. Let's go ahead and frame that up. You can see that the whole thing is just blobbing down. All we do is create the force and add on some extra strength. And boom, we've got dynamics reacting in a way that I had no idea we could do. And we've been able to do this since like version 12.5. So I feel bad that I didn't realize this. So if we go and we start tweaking around on these forces a little bit, let's go ahead and there's a bunch of different uh, fall off types. Step is kind of like a hard fall off, but I found for this particular setup, it was looking pretty good. Once again, just play with the different settings to start learning what they do. And you can see that this is behaving a little more blobby. Our strength is perhaps a little strong. Let's go ahead and cut this in about half and see what we get. Okay, ooh, nice, it is a significantly better, more fun blobbing going on there. I like that. But I don't know what the magic number is going to be here. Let's drop it by another 1,000. There we go. Now they're separating out a little bit, but you can see they definitely are maintaining a relationship between each other. So now we've got it oozing down. So it's not going to be an amazing resolution, but now in vanilla Cinema 4D, we've now got a very simple kind of fluid simulation going here. We can go ahead and increase uh, friction. We could change forces. We could have one force that was pulling them in really tight and the smaller one that pushes them a certain distance away from each other. Um, but now we've also got the new awesome R20 volume stuff. So we've got our volume builder and our volume measure. Let's go and create a volume builder. And here's a little hint. Uh, that I like doing when it comes to particles and we're doing this kind of uh, building a mesh around a particle is I like seeing what a single particle is going to do. Because if you've ever done different particle simulations and you kind of put them into a metaball or something, if they're too small, they'll kind of disappear from the simulation and then reappear into it and that, that always looks a little weird. So what I like doing is taking a single kind of particle of my simulation, throwing that into the builder and let's go ahead and immediately put this into our mesher as well. And let's zoom up and you can see that our cube 
which is normally pretty big, is really small there. I don't trust that. So we can go into our volume builder and we can just start changing our voxel size, which is the main setting. And you see as I move it around, it's kind of going to jump around. But I can kind of find this magic number, maybe right around there, where it's a little bit rounded, but now this individual single cube, this kind of particle that we're working with, that will continue to exist by itself. Now, of course, well, let's go ahead and um, not jump ahead of ourselves. Let's go ahead and drop that into our cloner. We go ahead and drop that cloner into our volume builder. Unfortunately, something that happens is the volume builder does not like the cloner directly. If I go and hit plan here, um, oh, actually, I, I was mistaken. I thought that was going to uh, not refresh unless we put it inside of a connect object, but it worked. Sweet. So you can see we've got individual particles that are blobbing in. Of course, they're really chunky looking there. They're really blocky. So we can go ahead and start smoothing that out, of course, by going into our volume builder and adding something like a smooth layer. Now you see we've got our smooth layer on top of all of those different things. Uh, this is talk about dynamics. So we're not going to spend too long in our volume builder here. But if I were to pull back on our smooth layer, we can get to exactly the amount. Like I said, I don't want any particles to disappear. So if something maybe like that would be working pretty well. And then on top of that, I often like creating the Cinema 4D smooth deformer, the smoothing. And if we go ahead and drop this into our volume measure, this will create some smoothing after the fact on that as well. And this one calculates a lot quicker. So I can pull this up and down, make that much smoother. Now our resolution is terrible here because I had a really small you know, clump of cubes here. You could crank that up, but of course it's exponential. If you made the cubes half the size, it's half the size on every axis. So it's actually two times two times two for calculation times. But you can see we've now got a really simple blobby liquid sim kind of going in vanilla Cinema 4D. And uh, it's just something I had no idea was possible. And there's a lot more cool things you can do with the dynamic force object. And I will be exploring that more in the future for sure. So let's go ahead and jump on into the next one. What do we got? Uh, vertex maps. So this is a little bit more our new R20 stuff. But vertex maps have become a lot more interesting recently because we can control them with fields. And vertex maps are something that in the past were kind of a pain to make. You'd have to go and paint them and then manually update them and change them uh, and then blur them to make them look good at all. But now with all of the new field stuff, we can control it very kind of parametric parametrically. So what are we going to be doing here? Well, first of all, uh, I want to explain a little bit of a process I've been doing. So I've got a shape here, and I'm going to want to be deforming this shape. So you can see I've got a platonic, and it's just subdivided here. And what I'm going to want to do is do some fun like compressing on it. I want to like crunch in, and then there's a really fun inflation method I'm going to show you here. But I don't want to just do it on its base geometry. Like we got a bunch of triangles. It's not too much. This is a mesh that cinema could totally handle. But I want to kind of change up the way this mesh looks a little bit so that when it's folding over on itself, that it's not these perfect triangles. So we get more interesting shapes. So something I've been finding is really cool is if is creating a brand new mesh off of another volume mesher. So if I were to take that same shape, our platonic here, and then feed that into a volume builder. And let's go ahead and turn on our volume mesher. Uh, I've got these tags on here for the deformer. So you can see if we go and play around with, uh, if I throw it into the volume mesher kind of just generically by default, you see it's still the default volume voxel size of 10, go into our volume mesher. If we go and we crank up our adaptive setting, it's kind of a fun new way of getting low poly geometry. And right now, I just want something pretty random. But you know if you throw this to a connect object, which is kind of one way we could fake low poly in the past, but that might grab a point from over here and merge it over here, and you have overlapping. Now you're getting a similar effect, but you, we won't get overlapping polygons or intersecting polygons because the volume builder is going to be fixing all that. So you see I get a lot more interesting geometry here. We might get more uh, diverse folds when this all collapses in on itself. So I've already got one mesh prepared based off of that. And let me go ahead and show you it. So we've got our volume mesher. All I did was make that editable. And here was our final shape here. And uh, we're not going to go through every little detail here. But in my soft body, I am applying a negative pressure. And this negative pressure is going to make it suck and compress in on itself. Um, now, the actual important detail here is I have stiffness turned on. Our shape conservation is stiffness. And what stiffness does in a soft body is it's constantly taking every single point on the mesh and telling it to go back to its original position. Like, go back where you used to be. And the stronger this is, the more it wants to jump right back to that spot. So by cranking up the stiffness really high, you can almost make an object be a soft body behave like a rigid body. But now we can go and have our stiffness cranked up really high. 111 is a really big number here. But we're going to feed it a vertex map. And this vertex map is currently completely red. So it's a vertex map with no point selected. There's no value in here, which means no stiffness is being applied anywhere. 
Um, but where this is going to get interesting is we can feed it some different effects. Um, we can do this from scratch, but I'm just going to talk my way through because we've got a lot to cover. So I made a, a freeze layer here, a freeze, yeah, it's not a layer, is it? What do you call the freeze? It's a freeze, a modifier, modifier layer. So we've got a freeze here, and the, what I'm doing is I'm feeding on top of it in the field. I am feeding it a shader field, and the shader field is being controlled by uh, this material here. And so what's happening is I've got a very, I've got noise that's completely black. And then over time, and I'm using uh, Grayscale Gorilla's signal plugin. I love this plugin. But all that's happening is over time, it's going to slowly animate this low clip over a little bit. So you see, we get some white specks, just a couple of little tiny light white dots. And that's all that happens. It stays in this very light section here. But then there's an animation speed setup. So when we hit play, it's going to be animating these dots around slowly. So what's happening is inside of our, of our vertex map, inside of our field, Every time one of our points turns white, it's going to freeze and remember that. And then it's going to move around. Our noise will move around and then touch another point, And then that one will freeze. So what's going to happen is we're going to have an effect where the noise is kind of constantly moving around and growing. And then each point is going to kind of snap from being completely turned off, completely red, jumping up to 100% and turning yellow and turning on. So based on that, let's go ahead and just take a look at just what this mesh by itself is going to do. So let's go ahead and rewind all the way, hit play, and... Um, it is going to be just falling and going crazy. What did I do wrong here? Let's revert the file. File, revert to saved. Yes, please. Okay, we're back. And let's go and take a look at our volume measure again. Take a look at our vertex map. And hit play. There we go. That's behaving the way I want to. So the negative pressure is pulling it all in, and you see it just collapses. It's something I've talked about in various tutorials. It's really fun, and they're not intersecting each other. So it collapses down. But now you can see that individual points are turning on based on that noise touching them. And that means each of those points is suddenly getting a really strong stiffness. And so we've got this thing unfolding, but instead of just unfolding, it's popping individual points out and eventually returning to its original shape purely by stiffness. It still has a negative pressure, but the stiffness is popping it out. And it's such a more interesting way for this to pop out. And there's a dozen different ways to go about creating this inside of fields now. But vertex maps have become so much more interesting as this object that we can control dynamically and use it to transfer data from one object to another, one from one source to another. And then we'll be using this technique a couple times today. Uh, what's happening is I'm taking this mesh, and then we're grabbing our high poly version, our final one, kind of still stylized. but if we go and we create a mesh deformer, why don't we just go ahead and do this from scratch. Let's go ahead and grab our object here, go into our deformer menu, and find ourselves the mesh deformer. Drop that as an object of this nice holly, high poly version. What do I want this to reference? I want to reference that vertex map driven low poly object. Drop it in. Very important detail. Change your, ac your uh, advanced tab, twirl this down, and change your external to surface or surface area. Both of them usually work almost identically. And just make sure that if any of your points slightly escaped your mesh, it still will calculate them and bring them along for the ride. Now we hit initialize, and now it has automatically applied all the appropriate tags to our volume measure, meaning when we hit play, this should collapse down, and now the exact same effect is happening on our higher poly object, but calculating all the dynamics, not only on the low poly object, but the very interesting, sub the, the, the interesting subdivisions of that low poly object. So it's going to collapse down, and now you can see it's going to be unfolding as each point slowly jumps up to 100%, and we get this really cool popping, snap, 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 pop, pop, pop. Uh, and it's just an effect that I, I can't imagine how I would have gone about doing that in the past before we could control the vertex maps now the, the way that we can. So let's jump on to what's next. Next up is Mo Dynamics. Okay, this is another one where I'm disappointed in myself because this has existed for so long. Mo Dynamics has existed since before the regular rigid body dynamics existed in Cinema 4D. And because they were kind of the older, slightly older by one half, you know, one half version of Cinema 4D, it was like in 11.5, Mo Dynamics came out and it worked on cloners. And then the next version, 12, then Dynamics suddenly worked on all objects. And I just ignored Mo Dynamics. And I shouldn't have been ignoring Mo Dynamics because they are really fun and interesting. And they solve a lot of problems that uh, I didn't think we had good solutions to. So what do I have here? Really simple scene. I've got a bunch of spheres. Uh, they're put into a cloner, and it's just stretching all the way across. Really straightforward. We've got a dynamics tag already applied, and there is one. Actually, why don't we try and do it from scratch, just to be sure. Uh, let's go ahead and right-click on our cloner and add a dynamics tag. Now, 
Typically, you, you will see me add a rigid body directly to my object because it just saves me having to click a single setting, which is how does, my dynamic, how does this dynamics tag get applied to the children? And you can skip that step by applying it directly to the sphere. But when it comes to mode dynamics, you do want it up on the cloner level. So let's go ahead on the cloner. I'm going to go ahead and add a simulation, a rigid body. And now we do have to jump to collision and go from individual elements to the top level. That's the one thing we have to keep in mind. Otherwise, nothing works. So we've got that going. What do we need to do now? Well, we can go ahead and go to our soft body tab. And I'm going to say, you know what? Instead of soft body, well, usually that's off, and that means rigid body. And then you can go to polygons and lines, which pretty much just means soft body. But of course, we can go to made of clones. And we've been able to do this since, I think, 11.5. So now, essentially, we've got soft bodies applying on our clones. So let's go ahead and do something like create a sphere here. In fact, I'm going to turn on two spheres. And without changing anything else, let's go ahead and hit play. And you're going to see that these are now automatically all attached. And we've kind of got this rigid beam going across. It's a, little, it's, a, it's, it's a little bendy, almost like a big piece of metal stretched across. But these are instantly connected. In the past, if we were going to try and start connecting a sequence of clones, we had to create a series of fixed connections, of, of, of fixed connectors. I've actually done on stage, talked about how we have to make a child, make the fixed connection, connect to the next one, go to the next one. We don't have to do that. You can just do it straight in these uh, mode dynamics. But we can start making these things a lot more interesting. I love the way soft bodies work on splines. If you put a regular Cinema 4D soft body onto a spline object, you can pretty much tie a knot out of it, and it will, it, it will maintain it. But there's a lot, of, a lot of limitations on that. The main one being is you can't kind of connect it to an, another object really easily. You have to use a spring. It's a little bit twitchy. You have to go really specific on the settings. But with these mode dynamics, what we can do is go ahead and create a, a MoGraph, MoGraph selection. And let's go ahead and select just this one clone over here. And the instant I do that, you see it makes a MoGraph selection tag. And that means that one point is selected. Let's go ahead into our dynamics and apply inside of our dynamics tab. We have a dynamic on. They're all dynamic objects. I'm going to say I only want that one object to be dynamic. It's actually the opposite of what we want. If I play, you're going to see, I guess, pretty much nothing happen. Uh, my, I might have miss, messed up my selection there. But let's go ahead and invert it and hit play and see if I did. OK, I did mess up my selection there. Let me go ahead and double click it and just make sure I grab my one clone there. Might have to be on object mode, actually. Double click, and that should go to the painter. Select, and let's see if that's applying now. Yes, OK, cool. So you can see that right now, the one selection I had, I'm saying, OK, you're dynamic. And it's kind of freaking out. It doesn't like that. But what's really cool is in the mode dynamic tab, if you click on this tag, we can go and say just, hey, invert that selection. So I can invert it and hit play. And now you can see that is now the only stuck object. So that, that is rigid. Now from this point forward, everything behaves exactly like a soft body. So that's where things get really interesting. If we jump into our dynamics here, I can go into soft body. And I can say I want lots of structure. Structure here is going to be how far they can pull apart from each other. But right now, they're not very bendy. So what we're going to do is we're going to grab our shear. And we're going to grab our flexion. And we're going to drop those down to zero. And now when I hit play, with zero shear and zero flexion, we've got a perfect rope going. And it was that simple to create a selection, and now it's stuck. And so it's almost like we're getting our, the power of the soft body, but with the ease of the spline dynamics. But the spline dynamics were never, they couldn't self-intersect and whatnot. And then what's additionally cool is this is live. So I can grab this and start moving around. And you could keyframe this, and you have control over the way those are moving. Uh, so we can now start combining these in a bunch more interesting ways. So we now have direct control of our resolution here. If I were to jump onto, uh, let's, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, we've got all these clones, but we could go ahead and say, let's not put quite so much space in between them. Let's go ahead and tighten them up. As we do this, they're going to start intersecting, and then I can go ahead and make some more of them. If I play, it's not going to like it because they're intersecting each other. So what we have to do, and it looks like I have to redo my selection tag because I created new clones. Um, and actually, we could use fields. I wasn't even thinking about this, but we could use fields to turn that off. But once, I, once again, I'm going to start it from scratch. I'm going to clear my selection, double click so I'm on a selection tool. I can select my one point there, make sure I invert it, and I should be able to play again. And we got control. So now you see we got a bunch of spheres, but they're intersecting each other, so they're freaking out. But just like soft bodies, and we'll be talking about this in a little bit, we can go into our dynamics tag and say, in, under collision, we can say, don't worry about self-collision. So this, these individual circles, uh, the spheres, will not be worried about bumping into each other. And now we've got this really high-resolution rope, but it's not going to worry about colliding with itself. 
And now we can get additional controls. If we want to make a rope out of this, we can go ahead and turn, uh, make a tracer. So I'm gonna make a tracer and then you drag the cloner in and then you make sure you turn it on connect all objects. And now we are generating a spline and that spline is going to go wherever that rope was going. So now we have a dynamic spline and you see it's even keeping, it's maintaining that dynamic distance away from our surface here. So that by itself is interesting. We could go ahead and create a, an inside and let's go ahead and create a sweep. We're gonna go ahead and grab both of those, make them children. And whatever the radius of our sphere is, which is 100, is what we want the radius of our inside to be. Let's go ahead and put that in. We'll tick up the sides a little bit more. So now we've got this rope. This rope should perfectly kind of lay right on the surface there. It's the kind of thing we've been able to do in the past. It was a little bit of a pain to do, but we could do this. But where things get even more fun and interesting is let's turn that off for a second. Let's look at our cloner. We can go ahead and add something on like a step effector. Adding the step effector onto this cloner, I'm gonna scale every single one of them up further as it goes along. And let's go ahead and go into our step effector and we could even grab our curves here and I can say, you know what, let's, uh, let's go and make it a little bit more tapered there. Uh, so now we've got this interesting shape, but if I were to hit play on these dynamics, it is now updating on each one. So these bigger spheres are going to react properly on that shape. So now we have all of this control to now add the sweep back in and let's go ahead and grab our end side. And what I usually do is uh, I'm gonna T for scale. I'm gonna scale it so it's big enough to encompass the entire thing. So we'll go as big as it needs to get. And now we can go inside of our sweep and go to our details. And we can grab our scale and start pulling it down on this end. And we can even sort of match our curvature there. So now we've got geometry that's matching it that quickly. Don't need to see the cloner anymore. And now we've got this way more interesting dynamic shape going correctly intersecting setup. We can make changes to the clones, all the setup. We don't have to go and update springs. They're already all linked to each other. It all goes down the road. Uh, like this, once again, I'm frustrated that we've had this for so long and I didn't realize how powerful these could be. And just to, sh to uh, hammer this home and how powerful these can be, let's go ahead and jump into a similar setup. I've got just kind of a little blanket here. And uh, the blanket is just Let's see, which object do I have that here? So it's just this plane, and you can see uh, if I hit NB, you can see our polygons, very low poly. And we can go ahead, and my cloner is cloning directly onto the surface of this plane. Anywhere one of these planes points are is where one of these clones are going to be. So let's go ahead and turn that on. So you see I got a whole field of clones. We're cloning onto the vertex of this plane. And now let's go ahead, and we've already got a dynamic tag up here, so I don't have to do a couple of those settings. Uh, but let's go ahead and set up our vertex, or yeah, our uh, cloner selection. We'll go to MoGraph, we'll go to, oops, sorry, misclick. Nope, I got it. I misclicked correctly. So make, uh, another thing, I, I kept messing this up. I want to make sure I'm in object mode, make sure I've got the cloner selected and the selection tag. And I'm going to go ahead and try and select the four corners here. Hopefully I'm getting them properly. And let's go ahead and say invert. And let's see, is the tag already set up for Mo Dynamics? Yes, uh, yeah, made of clones. So I should be able to hit play. And cool, you can see that dynamically these are falling away. Uh, now the next step, that would just be the normal plane being there. Gravity's taking over, they're falling down. Actually, um, I forgot to drag in my selection tag into our Mo selection. So that should hopefully lock our corners in. So yeah, there it's falling. And you can see we get this nice rubbery blanket thing going. Is that easy to lock those in the corner? And any shape based off of what that plane was already doing. But I want this to feed back into the geometry again. Uh, so this is a method I think that I'm going to be doing often. So we do have to use, there might be a way outside of Expresso, I'll have to think about it. But it's really straightforward in Expresso to go and set this hierarchy up. So it's just a couple of nodes. They're pretty advanced nodes, but they're not too many of them. So all we're doing is we're taking all of the information from our cloner object and then we've got our plane object. We're taking whatever object the cloner is and we're feeding it into a data node. And this data node is saying, how many clones are there? Cool. And then it's feeding that into an iteration node, which is saying, I want you to go from zero to whatever number of clones you have and then spit that number out. And that's gonna feed into a different a data node here. And that's also being fed the cloner. And what this one is doing is essentially iterating through every single cloner. It's grabbing the position here and it's outputting that position to become the point position of the plane. So all that is, 
All that means is we can now hide our clones there and we can turn on our plane. And all this is saying is even though the clones were created based on this plane, the plane will now move to wherever those clones go. So now we've got the cloth applied directly onto here. But it's run, it runs incredibly smooth. And uh, we can go ahead and let's give it a little bit of thickness here. Actually, not that much. Uh, let's go ahead and turn that on. Let's just give this a thickness of like two. Uh, so we've got this cloth. We hit play. And that's going to be nice and uh, bouncing up and down there. But uh, we have control over that. What I can do is add on. Uh, I've got a grayscale gorilla signal tag again. And I love me some signal. I'm going to go ahead and drag that onto our, I think, plane object here. And I'm going to make sure that my strength is now turned up. And all this is doing is it's applying, it's taking control of the Y position on this plane object. And it's going to randomly start wiggling it up and down. So it's kind of like the noise deformer, uh, but with a lot more control. So what should happen is it should be really calm in the beginning. And then it's going to slowly ramp up in power. You can see as more time goes by, it's going to start shaking this up and down more and more. Uh, actually, it looks like, do I need to do that on the... Uh, which object do I need that to be on? Or is it the plane? Yes, OK, sorry. I tried down to the wrong object. So now this one is going to move up and down. And as this is randomly moving, you're seeing we're getting all this really great uh, dynamics control directly out of this cloth. You see it's running incredibly fast. It's pretty low poly. But the mode dynamics are really fast at calculating, and they're really powerful. Because there's a bunch of spheres, and they're all intersecting each other. And let's go ahead and take a look at those again. So you can see this is what's actually there. But I can go ahead and start dropping additional dynamic objects in here. So this, is, this would be kind of tough to do in normal soft body. Like we've got these points covered. We can now see that we can bounce this around in real time. And that is now shooting up and down. But let's go ahead and turn on. Let's pause and rewind. Let's go ahead and turn on. Let's rewind twice so the espresso can refresh. Uh, so we got two more spheres on here. Let's go ahead and drop those. So they're going to fall in here, like working great, like getting some uh, real time playback on there. Um, uh, and I could grab this and move it around by hand. So that's just working in a really fun, dynamic way, really controllable, really quick. And but you can see how we could change this rig really quickly. Let's push it a little bit further. I'm going to go and turn on this cloner here. And let's go ahead and also drop 200 additional sphere clones on there. And, in, and see this playing back in real time, all of them falling on there, all of it just, just happening. So me ignoring mode dynamics was like one of the business, biggest mistakes I've made. So uh, you're going to be seeing a lot from me about mode dynamics in the future. There's so much cool stuff for making cloth and ropes and just having so much more control over that than we've ever had in the past. So yeah, I'm really excited to show that to you guys. I actually accidentally stumbled across that while preparing this presentation. So what do we got next? Uh, soft body for hard body. Uh, I've kind of talked about this technique before. I wanted to just touch on it because it's kind of a little overall tips and tricks about dynamics. Um, the idea here is we got some dynamic text here. Uh, it is set up with individual dynamics tags. And if, well, let's see, are these set up as rigid bodies? Uh, if these were set as rigid bodies and there's no gravity, I do have some turbulence. Um, the basic idea here being, uh, let's go ahead and delete that for a moment. Uh, I've got some some turbulence here. And if I turn on turbulence, these are just some rigid, individual rigid body letters. If I were to turn on this turbulence, hit play, and see them move around, you see it's just kind of what, what it's doing is it's grabbing the axis, the center point, the center of mass, and just saying, hey, move around. So they just move around. But if we instead, and these are very low poly, so they'll calculate super quick. If we were to change these not to be rigid bodies, but if we change these to be soft bodies, so let's go ahead and say that they're soft bodies by being made of polygons and lines. And you'll see down here that I have a stiffness cranked up to 11, which is pretty high. So these are going to behave almost like rigid bodies. But what's cool about this is because they are now soft bodies instead of rigid bodies, that same turbulence is being applied per point instead of just on the axis. So when these were just moving around before, now you can see that they get to rotate and kind of move with that wind. So that by itself is a pretty powerful technique if you want to be using these particle forces and making the objects behave a little bit more realistically. Uh, we can go ahead and uh, and then just art directing these and controlling them. Uh, I do suggest test uh, or going and checking out my SIGGRAPH presentation from, I think, two years ago, where I talk a whole bunch about some of these techniques. But I'm going to go ahead and paste in these wind um, deformers again, or these wind forces. And all I've done is I've created a series of winds, kind of one on each cardinal direction, two on each cardinal direction. And this wind is a wind saying, blow that way. 
and have a fall off. So it's going to try and blow that way, and as it gets further and further that way, it's going to slow down. But then I've got the equal and equivalent on every single axis, so we could go every one of these. So I'm pointing, I'm telling it to, if you're further that way, go the opposite. If you're too far that way, go this way. So all I'm saying is saying, hey, all of these clones, all these copies, try and stay towards the middle, but you have some leeway of moving around. The advantage of this is normally maybe you think to use a... Uh, attractor force. So you just have like an attractor and you say, hey, pull in closer. But ha that has some like natural physics built in, which is if something starts getting further away, it starts being affected less. But by using wind forces here, it's constantly full power all the time, no matter how far they get away and they cannot escape. So based on this, let's go ahead and turn all those winds on and hit play. And what's going to happen is the turbulence is going to affect all of these letters, and they're going to float around. But when they start traveling too far up, the wind is very gently going to say, no, 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 go back down again. And when they go down, they're going to very gently say, no, go back up again. If this was an attractor, you know, the, and if you played with attractors and this kind of soft body, very often if the soft body gets to the attractor and it gets kind of to that zero, zero, zero point, it gets like infinite energy and shoots it off into space. Uh, but here, that will never happen because the winds are very gently saying, hey, you went too far, start slowly getting pushed back. So you don't get kind of that heavy-handed effect. Um, so, yeah, these will all uh, chill out here. And we could go and iterate and do so many additional things here, but we've got more to cover. Uh, but, of course, you will see more on that from me as well. So what do we got next? Okay, soft body explosions. This one's, uh, this one's pretty quick. I'm not going to spend too much time on it. But my very, very first tutorial ever, like way before I did any video tutorials, is when the cloth came out. I think it was still called Cloth Hilda back then. Uh, and the basic idea there was that you could kind of explode an object apart if you're using soft bodies by using a very powerful negative attractor. So all that's happening here is I've got a soft body. It's inside of a cloth surface. Very important. It won't work if you don't put it inside of the cloth surface. And then uh, I, I'm cranking the iterations up here, like really high to 100, so that there's a lot of stiffness. But you see I have a tear setting on here. So if something stretches more than you know, 111% to its neighbor, it will now break that connection and tear apart. So this is kind of the old school one. I literally had a tutorial about this like 14 years ago or something. So it's just going to bounce around, and the negative attractor is going to pop, and it's going to force all the pieces apart, and you'll see them fall. You've probably seen this technique in various places now. Um, I was the one to do it first, but it's just really cool and fun. Uh, but there's a lot of limitations here. First of all, I had run the simulation a couple times, and I saw where it bounced around, and I just had to put the attractor in that particular location. I just, you see it's not moving, so this just happens to bounce in such a way where right when this negative attractor suddenly turns on with a, a lot of power, it pops away. So I had to manually do that. Of course, it's cloth, so like the dynamics aren't as, as quick or smooth. Like soft bodies calculate so nicely. So I spent a lot of time trying to figure out ways to do that. Um, in soft body. But one more thing, you've probably also seen this, but uh, it's really cool. Using cloth is another cool way of like blowing up a balloon and popping it or bubble gum. But I just wanted to throw out there um, that now that we have, well, let's go ahead and let this inflate. So you see it inflates and then boom, it can rip apart. But now, once again, with the addition of fields, we can go ahead and apply a vertex map to that shape. Uh, can't see it when we have the cloth turned on, apparently. So you see I've got a vertex map. If we go ahead and we do something like take that vertex map and apply it to our tearing field, and we do go and turn on our linear field and our shader field, it's going to create, I'm creating a uh, kind of a fall off from one side to the other. And all that means is when I hit play here, instead of it randomly popping, our, our uh, field, our fall off here said, hey, the left side of this object is way weaker. So the left side pops, and it's really easy to just apply a field fall off there. And you can just art direct that a little bit quicker. Once again, vertex maps are so much more powerful now. But let's jump over to where things started getting a little more interesting. Uh, this was my first experiment. I want, you know, I love everything being as uh, parametric as possible. Um, so this was the first experiment. I applied a bevel based on a tag, a subdivided cube. And I used a poly effects to try and scale down that selection. We see that it kind of deformed the geometry in a little bit of a weird way. Um, but, uh, it, but it gave me a little bit of hope that this would work. So I can go ahead and hit play, and you see it's going to fall away. And then suddenly, this negative attractor pops on with a lot of strength, pushing everything apart. And what's happened is, based on this poly effects shrinking these polygons down to nothing, they kind of aren't being calculated anymore, so they're ignored. So we're kind of getting the soft body effect. Well, we're getting like the cloth, but it's being applied to soft body. But it wasn't working 
perfectly because you can see like there's still a couple extra polygons and then especially here you see it scaled them down it's not working so well uh, another kind of technique that you can do is use the Voronoi fracture so this is uh, pretty straightforward I've got just a cube with a bunch of I triangulated it because soft bodies like triangles a little bit more and then I throw into a Voronoi fracture uh, normally you'd have colorized fragments on and you see it broke apart in all these pieces I told it to be uh, to be hull only, so it's hollow, it's only the surface. And then I get rid of those colors, and then we kind of do the exact same thing we were just doing, which is uh, that we've got a, an attractor, and then we can go ahead and it'll crank on at a certain moment, so let's hit play, and boom, it's gonna pop and they're gonna fly away. This works okay, but there are definitely some limitations where some triangles, I actually have trouble consistently repeating it, but sometimes you'll get a couple triangles that aren't that kind of freak out a little bit. There's one right there. It's not great, but sometimes they'll fly out in the space. But if you tweak the seat around, this technique actually can work really well to kind of get this little soft explosion off of that object. Um, but then the one where I, I thought it was working kind of best here was on this shape, where it's a similar technique, but what I'm doing is I've got a cube, and let's go ahead and apply this kind of random edge selection here, make a selection tag, and then I use a, the very old explosion deformer, and what this is doing is it's applying the explosion to all the different polygons, but that really what it's doing is it's breaking each of them apart, so you can see it's actually separating out each polygon parametrically, but there's no speed, so they've been broken apart, but they're still right next to each other, so pretty parametric there. And then when I apply the bevel, which is limited to that selection tag, then it's creating a very, very, very tiny bevel you see here. And I can go and crank that up a little bit. And you see that this bevel is actually creating these visual breaks in between our objects. So I'll leave that really tiny again. And then if we put this entire thing into a connect object and weld it, and you see the weld is very tiny and precise. So there are technically a couple breaks in here, but they're so small we cannot see them. And now if we run these exact same techniques, again, the soft body applied here, we've got a negative attractor, we can go ahead and hit play, and we're going to get a pretty dang parametric version of the old cloth technique, but using these soft bodies where we can even control the way these break apart. And now we, you know, we could change the stiffness of the way these are flying apart. Actually, that's not true. You cannot use stiffness, because stiffness is always trying to move everything right back where they are. But you can make the change of structure and the shear and the flexion and make these... Uh, a lot, uh, a lot more controllable, a lot more interesting, and it's keeping the setup pretty parametric overall. So let's try and crank through this really quickly. Uh, oh, dynamic animations. We're just going to do this real quick. I helped out uh, with Seth Worley's Red Giant short film some years ago, Spy vs. Guy. It's really cool if you haven't seen it. Um, but there's supposed to be this mechanical bird that was like really clunky and flying around oddly. And recently I was like, I wonder if I could have done that with dynamics. So I'm using some uh, basic aerodynamics here. So we've got some connectors and some motors that are ad applying a lot of power and it's just alternating them really quickly. So this is, is entirely dynamically driven. And then we can jump into the next one where I just drove, used those uh, dynamically flapping wings to apply to the bird and then use uh, some really, really strong... Uh, force here where there's a, a, a force of 55 which is really high to try and make it follow a particular position but now we can get this bird mechanically flapping around kind of semi-dynamically I just thought it was kind of fun to the idea of using dynamics to drive animations uh, it's softly transitioning as well so it has a refresh in the start but let's jump on up what do we got okay experimentation we're going to crank through a couple of these really fast um, uh, I already kind of mentioned the other one, so I won't go through it here, but I've got, here's a robot character I was working on for a while. Um, if I wanted to run dynamics on him, he's got way too many polygons here. That would be crazy. What we can do is throw this entire thing into a volume mesher. Uh, so let's go ahead and make a volume builder and then a volume mesher. Throw this entire robot into the builder. Throw that into the mesher. And by changing these settings... And he's kind of tiny here, but you can see as by changing these settings, we can dial it in and get a really clean, relatively low poly mesh. And now we could use that to start doing deformations on the rest of the character. Um, and so the, I don't have any specific point here, except that it's really fun to experiment. So it's just that character. He's being driven just like our old Pythonic was. Uh, and different dynamic effects. And I just go and change settings and experiment. And by going and playing around with that, you can get effects that you are not expecting I don't know that this would ever be useful to somebody, but by changing the pressure and the stiffness, it has completely changed the way this mesh is applied. So that one wasn't terribly useful. Uh, this one was a little bit interesting. He's melting down into the ground, and then uh, he will fall backwards, and considering how many polygons are being generated here, and it's a big, complex soft body, 
Uh, this is running incredibly well. But he just kind of flops on the ground there. You can see we've got this other mesh it's referencing. So there's quite a few polygons. Um, a, a very important detail here, and we didn't get to talk about it too much. It, I, you guys should definitely experiment with it. I'll have tutorials coming out. But with soft bodies, if you don't need self collisions turned on, turn those off, and they run so fast. It's crazy. Um, and you will see that uh, coming up in the final file. But I just wanted to run through a couple of these kind of quick experimentations I had done um, where all I was doing was doing the exact same file again and again and changing a couple of different settings inside of the dynamics. So this one kind of like bulged out and exploded. But because there's no self collisions, it's not like exponentially getting crazier. It can just keep on calculating and being weird. Uh, let's see. Uh, this one, it just is sucking all the pressure out from them and it's making the mesh really skinny. So yeah, once again, weird, fun, not terribly useful. But then this one, what I did with this one is I made an attractor. And I gave it some fall off uh, so it can't go too crazy when it goes in the center. Exact same mesh, uh, no collisions on the soft bodies. But on this one, those other ones, like maybe I'll never use those. But on this one, it made a really cool black hole effect. And it's being driven via dynamics. I was like, oh, this one, this one I could actually see using this for something where everything's getting pulled in a single point. And based on that fall off, you see it's, it, and this is what I was talking about earlier. You see the attractor. If it's close to the attractor, it gets pulled more. If it's further from the attractor, it's not attracted as much. So like, oh, that's actually a pretty cool effect there. And then it's like, okay, well, if we go and move that exact same effect down to the bottom, we've got like almost a perfect Ghostbusters ghost trap here where this is getting pulled down exactly like Slimer got pulled in. And if you were to ask me, I would have not been sure how to go about creating something like this. But just by playing with these settings and seeing what you know, could be achieved with the soft bodies, it was able to make a really cool effect. This one is just applying a turbulence as well. And now we're going to take this. And you could imagine this as any shape. Like, you know, this could be a building. It could be an entire city. It could be a tree. But it's going to kind of waft away. But you could imagine baking this and then... It could be a tree, and you bake this, and then you run it in reverse, and then this kind of misty thing will rewind and then become a tree. So just playing around with those different things, like it opens up the possibilities. Uh, the very final one I've got here is deformation. We kind of talked about, I've talked about this in the past, but I thought it was fun and we could revisit, especially using those same techniques we talked about, using the volume builder and the volume measure. I was able to take this entire car model I designed, just this goofy kind of art deco-y car, uh, and I just threw the entire car into a volume mesher, and you can see this awesome, let's go ahead and hide the car. Look at this awesome, super clean, low poly mesh that the volume builder gave me. And this is perfect for driving the mesh deformer. So by running the dynamics on this low poly mesh, applying it to the car via that same mesh deformer we were already talking about, we can go ahead and hit play and have our particle emitter start shooting out a bunch of logs and start crushing the car. This is using the plastic deformation. It's a really cool setting if you haven't played with it. Uh, inside of soft bodies, uh, the two main settings are this elastic limit. And if you put the elastic limit really small, essentially if a polygon bends too far, it will suddenly break and then remember to stay in that new position. And the other important setting is under stiffness. So I told the car to be very, very stiff. But if it moves too far, if it moves more than five units, break and stay in that position. So we're crushing, crushing the hell out of this car. But we go ahead instead of crushing it there, why don't we go ahead and turn off that emitter. Let's turn on this pole here. Let's go ahead into our dynamics tag. We'll turn on, under dynamics, we'll turn on custom initial velocity. And let's go ahead and give it a ton of speed going forward. Actually, let's go, let's go easy on it. Let's just do 500 so we can do a, a, a little fender bender here. So bonk. But look, we got a nice little bit of damage on the car. But, uh, and it's going to remember that. But it's more interesting if we make it more powerful. So let's do 5,000. Hit play. Boom. Crunch the car, instant damage on there. And you see it's, a, it's so incredibly low poly. This is running real time in the viewport. So you could imagine cranking this up to 10 times the resolution and really getting a ton of detail in there. So that's flinging that forward. Uh, let's go ahead and give this car a bad day. Let's go ahead and Kurt turn on a wall back here. So instead of uh, going forward, why don't we put a negative on there? We'll let that go backwards. So he's trying to reverse away from that accident. Oh, nope, bad day again. Hey, why don't we go ahead and put another five on there? Why not? So let's see what happens here. This, oh, oh, that's bad. Um, so yeah, you can't go forward, you can't go backward, so let's go ahead and, uh, and go up, but, like, nope, bad day there too. <laughs> so, uh, once again, like, just playing with stuff, seeing the possibilities and how you might be able to apply it to your own work, your own projects, that's what I really want to emphasize here is just exploring, experimenting. There's so many cool features in here, and you guys know how much I 
you cinema 40 all the time and just while making this project there's so many things where it's like oh mo dynamics why didn't i why wasn't i playing with this like forces this opens up so many cool possibilities and even though i knew about turning off the uh self collisions with the soft bodies playing with them more has opened up new opportunities and cool new things uh different ways of solving problems um so uh, that is going to wrap it up for me uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, watching. And you can go ahead and follow me at Rocket Lasso on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook.com. So thank you very much, everybody.